Uh, so this is the last lecture, um, and it's going to be, uh, we'll spend the first 10 minutes talking about all the logistics for the end of the, end of the semester wrapping up. And then we have Marcel Kornacker from Cloudera here today, who's going to give us a guest lecture on uh, the uh, Impala and Kudu. And Impala is the OLAP system that he has led the development on at uh, Caldera for seven years now. And then Kudu is sort of their uh, storage layer that can do sort of more all to be things. So they're put together, you get an HTAP system, which is the, sort of the main thing we've been talking about this entire semester. So, um, all right, so we'll finish off talking about logistics, then we'll do a quick review on the final exam, and then Marcel will spend the rest of the time uh, talking. All right, so just to wrap up everything that's going on, this is the same schedule that I showed you last time. We'll have the final exam in class this Thursday, uh, May 4th at 12 p.m. And again, it's going to be a combination of multiple choice questions and short answer questions. And it'll be an hour and a half long, uh, or sorry, yeah, hour and 20 minutes long, um, closed notes, and, I'm, and I'll cover at the end what are the topics that are fair game for you guys. Um, the code review will be due also for the second round will be due on May 4th at uh, 12 p.m. Some of you have already posted new uh, PRs on GitHub. Uh, other people have talked about how there's issues that when you pull in the latest version of the master, that brings in the new LLVM engine, and that causes problems, so we can discuss that as well. Uh, and then the final presentations will be not in this room, but in Wien Hall and somewhere else, I don't know where. Uh, and that we'll do at 5.30 p.m., and I think this is a Tuesday. Uh, and we'll have 12 minutes per group, and then we'll have a contest where we vote. Everyone votes to say who has the best project. You can't vote for yourself, you have to vote for somebody else. And then whoever wins will have the, will have the grand prize. But everyone will get a database uh, t-shirt in the end, from, donated from, from various companies. All right, so then for the final uh, code drop, I actually misread the schedule again. Uh, grades aren't due for, for Pittsburgh students until uh, May, May 17th. So the, the, uh, the Cutter students are due on the 11th. That's why this was originally 11th. So the final code drop for you guys will be due May 15th. And this is where you're gonna have to send us a PR on GitHub where your code can cleanly merge in with the master branch, you pass all the tests, um, and you include documentation that uh, what your code is doing, and you have additional tests that show that you're, you can correctly verify that your implementation for whatever your project is, is actually working correctly. And again, we've talked to us before, it has to be a real test that actually checks programmatically whether the database system is actually performing the function that you want it to, and not just printing out output that things are okay, right? That's not a real test. Um, and again, so I realized also too, because the LLVM engine is uh, a major change we put in the system that may have affected some of you people, uh, what we'll do is we'll have a way to disable that so you can just go through sort of the, net, the regular interpreted engine. For some of you, this won't be an issue at all. I know, but in the case of the compression team, right, the LLVM engine doesn't actually make calls to the storage table anymore. It goes directly in memory, right, which is what you want an LLVM engine to do. But then that sort of fouls up how the way they do compression. So for them, again, we'll, we'll provide a flag that can disable that so that they're all, everything that still works. And so as far as I know, nobody else should have sort of the, maybe the same issues. I think for the constraints team, everything still goes to the data table. Um, for the other team that's working on LLVM stuff, uh, we can talk about that separately. That's more complicated. But as far as I know, for everyone else, this, this should be not a, a major change that causes problems. Is anybody else having uh, similar issues to like the compression team? Has any, have everybody else merged in the latest version of the master or no? All right, yes, Patrick. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's let's discuss this tomorrow. Okay. All right. Again, so just uh, you know, I'm super flexible. I'm you know, this is I realize this is a complex project. And there's a lot of moving parts, and a lot of people are working on the system. So we, you know, we'll do the best we can to accommodate everyone uh, for this. Okay? But the, the, end, the end thing is that you, the, the, the final PR has to be done by May 15th now. And again, the, the website has been updated to, to reflect this. For the extra credits, unfortunately, uh, we broke the website this weekend. Everything, if you, if you started working on your article on the website, er, all the data is still there. It's in MySQL. It's not in our database system yet, so everything's safe. Uh, 
And so what will happen is we're going to try to fix the website today and restore everything. If we can't do that, then what we'll do is provide you with a, uh, a JSON file. You can just sort of fill in the, in the information um, and then you, you can use that to submit your article. And then when the website is fixed, we just upload it into to the system. And that's how we, how we did it last year. And the same thing, the, the, new, the new due date for this will be May 15th and, uh, at, at midnight. And that gives me enough time to grade it over two days and, and put your grades into uh, S3. Okay? All right, so I brought this up last time. I'll bring this up again on, uh, on, on Thursday. I need everyone to fill out the course evaluation. Don't blow me off like you blow off other classes. I actually do look at your feedback, and it does, it does help me change how we do things in the course. Like, so last year we had people implement the BW tree in the course evaluation. Everyone said that was too hard, and that's why we did the skip list this year. So you can put whatever you want. Just be mindful that I already know some of these things already. So, you know, depending whether you want to put these or not, it's up to you. So I already know that auto lab sucks. I already know that's a pain. It didn't, you know, wasn't running all the time. I already know that you guys want me to make the system be able to compile and work on the Mac. All right, we tried that. That was hard. Uh, I also recognize that all the changes we're doing with the source code conflicts are annoying. Uh, we'll, you know, hopefully in the next year the code will be more stable so, so future students won't have this problem. And I recognize that, again, that I know that my personal hygiene has been declared as offensive. I've been seeing a doctor about this. It's, it's been a work in progress. So we'll, we'll see how it goes next year. Okay? They gave me this like, sort of special shampoo to sort of mask the odor, but it's not, it's not working well. Okay? All right, so any questions about, about logistics, about the final project or the extra credit or, uh, you know, course evaluations? Okay, so for the final exam, again, it's be one hour and 20 minutes. It'll be three to four questions. It'll roughly take you, you know, uh, depending on how fast you are, it can maybe take you less than 10 minutes per question. Uh, it's closed notes. And again, the reason why it's closed notes is because it's not meant to be, did you read this paper? Or can you tell me what this, they said in this one paragraph, right? Because that's, we've read a lot of papers, we've covered a lot of topics, and that's not really the point in this course. The point of this course is for you guys to understand how would you build a modern database system by combining all these different ideas of the different topics that we talked about. So that's why closed notes, uh, that's, why it's, that's why it's closed notes. All right, so the topics that are I mean, relevant for the final exam are, uh, we're gonna focus mostly on OCC and MVCC uh, concurrency control. You have to know what the different kind of storage models we've talked about, the NSM versus DSM. How would you actually do them in an in-memory database system? What are the, the pros and cons of each of them for different types of workloads? You should know about the different query processing models we talked about and what are their trade-offs again. The tuple at a time, that's from the iterator model or Volcano. The materialized model, that's in uh, HStore or MoneyDB. And then the vectorized model, that's in, but that was in VectorWise. You should know about the different join algorithms. Again, I don't care about the complexity of sort merge versus hash join. I more care about uh, how do you implement a mo sort of modern variance of these things. Right? What, do you, what, do, what are the, the, the trade-offs, what are the different design decisions you have to make to do a parallel hash join algorithm? You should know about logging schemes. I'm not really going to focus on checkpointing schemes, but for, for logging schemes, you should understand the difference between uh, logical logging versus physical logging or command logging. Right? When would you want to use one versus another? Or what, what, what are the pros and cons of each of these? Uh, you should know about the different types of uh, indexes we talked about. Right? We talked about a bunch of different OLTP indexes. We talked about BW tree. You guys implemented a skip list. We talked about a, you know, at a high level B plus, B plus tree. We also talked about T trees. Um, and then we talked about these OLAP indexes, like from, from the SQL Server paper, right? The, these bitmap things um, and the columnar indexes. So again, you should understand what they, um, what they are, what are their design implications, and how would they may fit in with the different storage models or query processing models, right? If you're doing two at a time, would, would you know what, what, what would be a good OLTP indexes versus a, a bad one? Okay. Uh, then the last, last three topics we're going to cover are uh, optimizer implementations and cost models. We spent three lectures uh, talking about the different types of cost or, uh, optimizers you can have, top-down versus bottom-up, stratified versus unified, right? cascades, volcano, system R, all these different things. So you should understand uh, what, what, are, you know, what are their design trade-offs, uh, how well they would work for different, different scenarios, and then cost models are sort of at a high level like what are the different things you can include in a cost model? Right, we mostly focused on, for in-memory databases, we focused on the number of tuples that each physical operator would emit. 
So you know, there's, there's other sort of logical things, you have to, you have other things you have to consider in, in a logical operator versus a physical operator. Uh, so those things should be, should be aware about. Compression schemes, we spend a lecture on this, right? Dictionary encoding, delta encoding, bitmap encoding, uh, mostly encoding from Redshift. And again, same thing, like what, what, are, the, what are the downs, what are the, the pros and cons of each, each, each of these things? And then the last topic would be sort of the, the, sort of the last quarter of the, of the semester we spent time talking about execution optimizations. So query compilation, code gen, JIT stuff with LLVM or C++. And then we spent two lectures talking about vectorization. We talked about bit weaving. We talked about just doing uh, parallel or parallelized sequential scans and predicate evaluation. We're not going to, so the, the final exam is not going to cover anything on the, the last two lectures on larger than memory databases or, um, or non-volatile memory databases, right? Because that was sort of too, you know, that, that was last week, all right? Any questions? Any concerns? Again, I passed out the practice final exam last class, and that's roughly what those question, the questions in the final exam will look like. Right? So if you're comfortable with those kind of uh, high-minded questions, if you will, then that's what the, the final exam on Thursday will look like. Okay? Okay, that's it. All right. Um, so like I said, it's been, it, 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 it's been an awesome semester. Um, and I always like to finish off with having a, so somebody from the real world come in and tell you how it is or how academia is completely wrong, or in some cases where we're completely right. And so Marcel is a, uh, as I said, he's the lead architect of Cloudera Impala. Um, he's been there for seven years. Prior to that, he was the lead architect of Google F1. Would that be correct? Uh, the, the query engine. The query engine at, at Google F1. And then his, the thing that helps him pick up women or men, whatever he wants, when he goes out the bars, is he tells everyone he worked on Times 10 before it was acquired from Oracle. That's his, when you think Marcel, just think Times 10, okay? Uh, and he has a PhD, what's that? Definite selling point. Definite selling point. He has a PhD from Berkeley, and he was Mike Snowbreaker's student in the 1990s. And I sent that article on Wired about how awesome he is at baking bread. Uh, so if you have any bread questions, you should ask Marcel after, after his talk, okay? All right, so let's give it up for Marcel. Uh, thank you. Oh, I see. Uh, does that work? Yeah. One, two, three. Yep. Okay, great. Let me see. This is on. It's also on. Fantastic. All right. So um, just for background, this talk, well, this talk is about um, the combination of Impala and Kudu. Kudu is a new storage manager for the Hadoop environment that gives you online updates. And I'll, again, talk more about it in a few minutes. This was uh, a talk created for a trade show called Strata and uh, uh, mostly for a not too technical and not database audience. So I'm going to splice in uh, sections from the tech talks for Impala and Kudu themselves. So, um, but also please feel free to interrupt with questions uh, during the talk and don't hold back and wait until the very end. So here a brief overview what Hadoop is. Actually, quick question for the audience. Who has a rough idea of what Hadoop is? Okay, some, some minority. Okay, so I'll talk more. Um, basically, Hadoop is a collection of components that are meant for, uh, vaguely for data management. That sounds very vague because it is. There is no really good definition. What you find in Hadoop is, um, let's focus on this part. In that part today, there are a number of storage managers in the Hadoop environment. HDFS is the best known one, the file system, uh, patterned after Google's uh, GFS. Then uh, we're also going to be talking about the thing in the middle there where it says relational Kudu. This is a new uh, 
uh, online storage manager that in, um, in contrast to a file system gives you the ability to insert, update and delete records. So meaning it has a record oriented interface as opposed to a file interface. And then for the purpose of this talk, I'll be um, mainly focused on relational data management. And for that, we're gonna use the Impala uh, SQL engine and talk about how it interacts with Kudu basically. So here, like I said, uh, the interesting part here is relational data management. So it's going to be Impala and I'll be contrasting that as well with HDFS and a little bit HBase, very little HBase. Here again, just you know, talking about the storage managers. So taking a step back, what does uh, um, relational data management slash analytic applications, what do they look like, quote unquote, in a traditional Hadoop setup, traditional again, because Hadoop is not that traditional, but um, HDFS has been around for a while. You would basically use HDFS to store your data files. Your data files are um, prepared through some ingest pipeline. You typically will use a columnar format such as Parquet. And once you have your data sitting in Parquet and HDFS, you can then use Impala to basically point to, those, um, to that physical data and run your SQL queries. And Impala is fast enough so you can actually run interactive uh, you know, business intelligence applications such as Tableau or MicroStrategy, which is um, what a lot of large companies do. So, um, what does that give you? That, first of all, gives you the flexibility to use the Hadoop environment and in particular use multiple data formats. Although you typically want, uh, for performance reasons, you want to use something like Parquet, meaning a columnar format. Uh, that also gives you the proven scalability of HDFS. HDFS has been around for quite a while. Uh, it scales up to, you know, hundreds of nodes, I want to say easily. It scales up to very large amounts of data and it has um, uh, the uh, availability also works reasonably well. Um, that's all great. HDFS also has performance optimizations that when you are doing large data scans and you're doing that locally, meaning you are um, initiating the scan on the data that happens to sit on that same node in HDFS, then HDFS will actually bypass the data node protocol and you can talk to the underlying file system directly, meaning you will get the speed that you would normally get from the Linux file system. So, you know, pretty much basically what the hardware gives you. Uh, HDFS also has a caching component that allows you to map file data into memory. And then instead of reading it from the cache, which still is a process to process copy and basically would entail um, re um, um, check summing and stuff like that, uh, you would simply simply map it into your address space and you would basically get a copy free get copy free access so all great things however doing something like updates in the in hdfs is uh, impossible or you know very painful if not impossible um, hdfs is an append only file system and obviously if you have a columnar format you don't want to go in there and try to change individual records um, there is the other thing called HBase. HBase is also an online storage manager. HBase has been around for a while. HBase is used by a number of our customers to do stuff like uh, point lookups for serving web apps. HBase does allow you to do online updates, so you can do insert, update, and delete against individual records. However, HBase has a HBase is patterned after Bigtable, and as such, it inherited Bigtable's I want to say very flexible, overly flexible schema uh, and physical schema characteristics. So in Bigtable, basically the columns are really part of the data and every row can look different. Um, and the way HBase um, materializes data to disk and makes data uh, persistent on disk means that when you read data back, you actually have to do a lot of merging operations. And those are expensive merging operations because um, HBase basically writes data out into SS tables and then it has to merge it back based on a, um, the primary key, which is a string. So all very expensive operations, which means that in effect, you are getting a small fraction, a single digit percentage point of the actual hardware capabilities when you're doing sequential scans. So. For the purpose of updates, it works. For the purpose of doing analytic applications, it doesn't work at all, I want to say. Um, 
This is where Kudu comes into play. Kudu is an online storage manager like HBase, but unlike HBase, it is also optimized for read throughput, meaning raw scan performance. Um, it has made some architectural choices that avoid expensive merges and things like this. Kudu um, accumulates data in a row format in memory. Um, that means you can do relatively inexpensive updates in memory. And then when it writes data to disk, it transposes the data into a columnar format, very similar to what Parquet gives you. So I'll report some numbers later. But here the goal was to create a storage manager that can handle both um, insert, update, and delete, and do point lookups very efficiently, but also give you very efficient scans. And the, um, the goal here is that in combination with Impala, you will get uh, real-time analytics and also um, update capabilities that come close to what you can now get with the best systems, meaning with HDFS and, and HBase in Hadoop, but you're getting it in a single system, um, and you don't have to move data between those systems. Does Kudu support transactions? Kudu right now only supports single row transactions, so like HBase. The goal is to add multi row transactions in the future. So, the real, uh, you know, the sort of the vision behind this is to replicate the user experience of a single node RDBMS, right? So, from an application programmer's perspective, an RDBMS is great. It gives you comprehensible semantics, it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can change your data, you can query your data. Um, of course, a single node RDBMS has uh, no scaling, and, you know, you can't use it for very large applications, obviously. Let's talk about Impala for a second. So Impala is the query engine component of the stack that I'm talking about. And um, what does Impala look like? Impala is a SQL engine. So it is it's basically a parallel SQL engine. It is specifically not a monolithic database system. And I'll talk about the differences in a little bit. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind when comparing database functionality in Hadoop and a you know, traditional database system like Oracle, that there are differences, operational differences, that um, also impact the user experience and how you would interact with the system. So, but here Impala is uh, basically a parallel database system, MPP. It uh, was designed for performance, so this is unlike a lot of other systems. It didn't use Postgres as an execution engine. It was actually written from the ground up. And it was particularly designed for the Hadoop environment. So um, that means it utilizes components of the Hadoop environment that allow it to interact with the other frameworks that are also running in Hadoop. So typically, our customers do uh, data preparation and ingest with things like Hive or Spark or MapReduce. They might do uh, batch transformations also with something like Spark. So there are a number of frameworks that are interesting. And um, the goal is to retain the flexibility and the data sharing ability that you typically find in a Hadoop environment. So uh, Impala supports the Hive Metastore as a metadata repository, meaning that when you create a table in Impala, it is visible in Hive and vice versa, and, and Spark as well. Um, Impala uses, obviously, the storage managers that are prevalent in Hadoop. So we talked about HBase and HDFS and now Kudu. And if you're talking about uh, HDFS resident data, Impala also supports the file formats that are standard in a Hadoop environment. So Parquet is one of them. There's also Avro. We don't really want to talk about RC file, but our customers still use text, which is you know, con convenient for ingest, etc. cetera. So um, Impala also supports those um, standards. Now, because of the target application, in particular business intelligence environments for interactive querying, Impala also supports the standards that have evolved in that space. So that means you need ODBC and JDBC for connectivity. Uh, you want Kerberos and LDAP for authentication. And you want things, uh, basically SQL style, role-based authorization. Right? These are all standards in the corporate environment. And if you don't support them, then people don't want to use your stuff. A um, little bit about the history. Impala started, as you said, actually was started around six years ago in uh, the first commit was made in May of 2011. It was released in beta in October of 2012 and then went uh, GA in May of 2013. So it has been around for, uh, in GA now for four years roughly. 
pretty much exactly four years. Um, and uh, Impala is open source, now is transitioning to, has always had an ASF um, license, is now transitioning to ASF, uh, uh, ASF project management, and uh, has some external contributors from, we got something from Intel, we had some you know, small things from Google, there's also Arcadia data with uh, which we're collaborating, which is a BI tool. So, um, you know, if you want to hack on Impala, that is, um, you know, pending approval by your master here. Well, obviously, over, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're free. They're free. <laughs> um, so what does Impala look like from the user's perspective? Like I said, the goal here is to, um, or the the usage scenario is, business intelligence um, applications. So. What you're doing in Impala is you're creating basically, when you create a table, you're really creating a virtual view over the physical data stored in HDFS, for instance. So here's an example of a you know, customer table and you're basically telling Impala that the file format is Parquet and here is a directory location. And basically all of the files underneath that directory are now part of that table. Um, Impala also gives you, Impala and Hive give you physical Schema design capabilities such as partitioning. The partitions are then created as subdirectories. So uh, it is uh, basically the logical partitioning is then directly translated into physical partitioning in the file system. And for each partition, there is a single partition directory. And again, all of the files in that directory are part of the data. Um, that also means that when you copy a file into a partition directory, it automatically becomes part of the table. So uh, something to keep in mind that this is an ingest path that is very different from that of a monolithic database system where all data gets inserted into or goes through a funnel that starts off the top of the, that database system. Yeah, how does this work for like, does the, does the Parquet API enforce like in string, like not null field and things like that? No, I mean, uh, does it have not null? I'm not sure, I think it does, but um, it, every Parquet file comes with its own schema. Okay. So what you now need to make sure, well, when you're copying a data file, you need to make sure it matches that schema. If it doesn't match that schema, you're gonna get a runtime error. Um, if it, you, you will also have schema evolution. You're gonna add fields. You typically don't wanna drop fields. You might deprecate fields. And you need to do that in a particular manner in order for you to be able to then read the data. But that's outside Impala, that's like? That is outside of Impala, yeah. Impala will, help you with that when you, you, you can add tables, uh, you can add columns through Impala and it will then do the right thing in Parquet. Yeah. That's basically what it is. So Impala implements standard SQL, uh, basically ANSI SQL, I think we call it 92, with the uh, analytic function extensions, supports standard data types, including decimal. Decimal is very important for uh, financial applications, right? Nobody wants to deal with floating point um, imprecision. And your UDFs are what, not PLPG SQL? Like oh yeah, exactly, UDFs. But I mean, you know, obviously we could spend time on making that better and we could even try to support something like Oracle stuff that would obviously be extremely time consuming and have limited applicability, so we're not gonna do it. But UDFs today are in Java and C++. And uh, I'll talk more about LLVM runtime code generation, but if you're doing C++, you have the option of either um, getting it into the system via a shared object or even cross-compiled IR. So we can, you know, we can load your IR and then do the, um, the cross-function call optimization. What does Impala look like? If you've ever seen a parallel database system, it looks very similar. You basically have a daemon process running on every node in the cluster that has relevant data. The goal here is to do data partition parallelism. So I'll talk more about the query optimization framework, but in essence, it means that uh, you're gonna run, you're gonna do as much processing as you can on the nodes that have the data. And then what comes after that is basically a bunch of uh, process to process data exchange and uh, pipeline query execution. In addition to those execution daemons, you also have two single node um, single node systems here at the top, the state store and the catalog service. So Impala is a, uh, has a symmetric architecture. Every, uh, of every one of the Impala daemons can also act, can act as a coordinator, meaning handle user-facing requests, and can also act as an execution engine for the backend execution. 
Um, that means they're all caching metadata. If you wanted to get metadata from the suppliers of metadata in the system, which are Hive and uh, the Hadoop name node, that would make query execution extremely slow and also be very much not scalable. So there is a catalog service in the system, a single node system, that manages the interaction with the Hive Metastore and also gets um, physical metadata updates from the Hadoop name node. This catalog service um, then compiles basically updates that it then sends out to all the Impala daemons and it uses the state store, which is a pub subsystem, a small in memory sub pub subsystem for that purpose. And there was a question. Uh, so when you, say, when you say you cache the metadata, do you mean the metadata in the catalog? And you cache it in uh, each node? Or yes, that's right. We cache the metadata in all of the nodes. Um, we actually just implemented a separation of execution of the uh, coordination functionality, the front end functionality, and the execution. But each node can still play both roles, right? So you can have, um, you know, typically people would have, let's say, maybe a few dozen coordinators in the system, and they're all caching metadata. Again, the reason here is that when you want to run a query and you want to do that in under a second, you don't have time to go to the Hive Metastore and get all the logical metadata, and then after that go to the name node and get all the physical metadata, right? That alone would take you more than just a second. Um, and then, of course, you would end up with a very much not scalable system because every query would then basically have to go to the same uh, Metastore and name node. The state store, as I said, is a pub subsystem. It's a single node system, but it doesn't store anything. And meaning at a soft state, you can basically take it down and bring it back up and it can reconstruct its state. And, um, the, you, can, and you can still run queries in the cluster even when the state store is down. So the, the state store is not part of the execution control paths of a running query. The state store is only part of the uh, metadata propagation protocol. Likewise, the catalog service, like I said, interfaces with HMS, the Hive Metastore, and gets metadata from the Hadoop name node. It also is also soft state, meaning that if it goes down, it can reconstruct its state from the Hive Metastore and the name node. And again, it is also not part of the control path of a query. Um, but if you want to create a new table, then it would be blocked on the catalog service not being available. A few words about the execution daemon. It is uh, broken up into front-end part, which is actually written in Java. The reason was that uh, Java is easier, with Java it is easier to interact with the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem, in particular the HDFS, uh, the name node, and the HMS, uh, the Hive Metastore. The clients are all written in Java, so that made it easier. However, the execution system, the backend, is written entirely in C++, and that is what is basically um, on the hot path for query execution. Did you benchmark like thrift versus protocol buffers when you made the decision? No. It was easier at the time because thrift also had an RPC system baked in. Yeah. That's basically what it is. We're actually transitioning the RPC system to um, Kudu built a new RPC stack specifically and it's much more um, scalable in particular for large data exchanges. So that's what we're doing. Query execution is, runs in the typical phases. You have an application here. This is a three node cluster and the, all of the orange boxes are uh, comprise the Impala daemon. Um, it is internally not divided into different components, at least not in terms of threads. You don't have, you don't have a thread that does the planning and another one that does execution. Um, all threads can do everything. But here you have an application sending request via ODBC it uh, arrives at the planner. The planner turns around and produces a sequence of plan fragments that it then hands off to the coordinator. The coordinator in turn then distributes it to all of the execution backends that contain relevant data. So uh, because it caches all of the physical metadata, it knows about the location of all of the files and the block replicas and all that stuff. And so basically picks where it wants to run, uh, sends out the uh, plan fragments, and then the execution engines begin running and they produce intermediate results. Nothing is written to disk. Uh, you might have to spill, right? If you're doing a large join, you might have to spill. But outside of that, nothing is written to disk and they all do process to process data exchange and it's basically pipeline query execution. Um, this is what it does. Here you're doing a bunch of uh, scans and joins and um, 
that's basically a rough outline of how execution works. Now, talking about planning, planning in Impala is done in two phases. There is the uh, first, you produce a single node plan. This gives you a tree of plan operators, things like scan, join, aggregation, sorting, um, analytic function computation. Um, then you take that single node plan and in order to distribute it, you break it down and, uh, into plan fragments. So um, the goal here is the parallelization of all of the operators in the plan. So, and also as part of that parallelization, you want to do as much local processing as you can, meaning scans run locally. And you're doing, after the scan, you're also doing as much uh, pre-processing as you can. So uh, you might do pre-aggregation, you might do um, joins via broadcasts, etc. cetera. Um, Impala uses a cost-based decision model to create the join order and also uses a cost-based decision model to do join distribution optimization, meaning the decision between doing a broadcast join where you have a, let's say, a large fact table and a small dimension table and you decide to broadcast that small dimension table to all of the places that are executing the join. Uh, basically the places that are local to the a large fact table or you are doing a, a join of two large tables in which case you would have to redistribute both tables on the join expressions. So here's a very simple example of a single node plan. You are joining three tables followed by a grouping aggregation followed by um, an order by limits, which is typically implemented as a top n operation. Here you're seeing two joins in sequence followed by the aggregation, followed by top n. And Impala would actually, if it knows that you are accessing very little data, it would run that on a single node. So it would simply say you're only scanning whatever, you know, a few hundred nodes, uh, sorry, a few hundred rows or, you know, this many kilobytes of data. And I'm not going to distribute that. I'm just going to run this locally right here. Um, in the distributed case, um, the second step will then do the plan fragmentation and as I said before you want to maximize scan locality and minimize data movement. Parallelizing joins means deciding between broadcast and repartitioning join. Parallelizing aggregation typically means <coughs> you're doing a pre-aggregation on the grouping expressions which you can do locally which often results in a reduction of the intermediate result. Um, and then you're doing a merge aggregation on based uh, after a repartitioning step, a hash repartitioning step on the grouping expressions. Uh, when you're doing a parallel top n, you're again doing a pre-aggregation, top n is an aggregation, you're doing that locally on the node, uh, followed by now you have to merge on a single node, Obvi obviously otherwise you cannot do top n correctly, right, the semantics don't allow that. So your cost model for your query planner is based on never dial. Uh, no, it's actually simply based on total bytes touched. So this model is basically having to partition something where you have to touch all the bytes, where you have to put it on the network. So we don't really differentiate between um, the effort of network I.O. and all these things. And um, I think this sort of, in practice, it has been shown that a cost model does not need to be precise, meaning precise in the sense that it does not need to model exactly the cost. You, you use cost to decide between two alternatives. And the cost model has to be accurate enough to, so that the alternative that is more expensive during execution shows up as more expensive in the cost model, right? So if one is more expensive than the other, the cost of the one should be maybe 1,000 and the other 500. But it doesn't matter if it's 1,000 or 500 or if it's 10,000 and 5,000. The, uh, the only difference that you're interested in is that one is more expensive than the other. Right, so that's why we felt that bytes touched was a fair um, approximation of total effort involved. Here's the illustration of a distributed plan for that uh, simple query that we saw, two joins followed by an aggregation. Here you are initially joining two large tables. The two large tables are executed as scans on their um, respective nodes. Because they're large, you're doing a repartitioning join, which means that those scans run in separate plan fragments and the output of those is repartitioned on the, um, the join key. Here it's the IDs. You're then doing the join in a third plan fragment followed by the second join. The second join is now a small, uh, small table to large table join which is then done as a broadcast. This second join is then followed by pre-aggregation. 
um, which is then output into a fifth plant fragment after a repartitioning step on the aggregation uh, key, which is in this case the custom ID. Uh, then you're doing the merge aggregation, then you're doing local top n, and then followed by global top n back at the coordinator. So uh, this basically then results in a total of six plant fragments that are all run concurrently at all of the execution nodes, except for the last one, which only is run at the coordinator. A few words on the execution engine itself. It is, as I mentioned, written in C++. It uses data partition parallelism, and it also has some performance optimizations, the, um, the major one being uh, LLVM-based runtime code generation. And the way we do that, uh, I know um, you're working on Peloton, which does, uh, takes a slightly different tack, which is basically based on a DSL, as I understand it, and whole query optimization. We're doing it slightly differently. We are optimizing, so each of these operators that you see here, there's a scan, join, aggregation, is run as a loop over an input batch. So this is a batched execution, and when you're joining, you're basically presented with a batch, and you're then doing basically the hash table lookups for all of the rows in that batch, and you are then uh, computing the join and uh, augmenting the batch with the join results. This loop is our target of optimization. And what we're doing with LLVM is we're basically generating the code for the entire loop, including um, hash value computation, uh, lookup in the hash table, etc., and then using LLVM to basically produce one giant function for this loop with expressions inline and all that stuff. So there are no virtual function calls, etc. Whoops. I don't need to talk you through this. And obviously, because we know the types at runtime, you're going to get rid of dead branches. Uh, you can unroll some loops. Um, you propagate constants, all that stuff. So we're seeing, obviously, a massive uh, performance improvement with that kind of execution. We can leave this out. Well, I mean, this is, this is one example. The actual savings depend very much on the query. Here's a bunch of single table aggregates. aggregates the first one being count star, the absolutely um, most simple one. And then uh, the last one, TPCHQ1, which has like uh, three or four aggregates that require some arithmetic expressions. And here you can see a 16, factor 16 speed up over this is on basically memory resident data. So, you know, the cache is warmed up, so it doesn't come from disk. And uh, obviously, massive speed up. Uh, let's skip through this. We did that already. Now, on to Kudu. This basically concludes the Impala part. Now, on to Kudu. Kudu is now the um, storage manager sitting underneath it. And what is it exactly, or what were the targets? One thing was scalability, so this is meant to, scan to uh, scale to tens of petabytes of data and thousands of nodes. Um, targets were both the uh, throughput of read and write operations, meaning you should be able to do very fast streaming inserts and also very fast lookups, but also analytic performance, and that is measured usually in gigabytes per second. So here the goal to be able to scan large amounts of data per node in order to facilitate analytic queries. What does Kudu look like under the covers? Kudu exposes, unlike HBase and Bigtable, Kudu has a schema that looks more like a relational schema, meaning it's a fixed schema. You have pre-declared columns. You can, of course, add columns, but the columns themselves are typed. And the column name is not part of the, part of the data. Uh, columns are typed. That also means that you can do, and Kudu does, um, when it stores data on disk, it is stored in a columnar format, and you can use typical columnar compression tricks which rely on the data being in the same data type. Kudu, aside from being integrated with Impala, Kudu, being part of the Hadoop environment, also has APIs, you know, NoSQL style, record level APIs in C++ and Java and Python, and Kudu is also usable via SQL from Spark and I think maybe even Hive. How do you do, how do, you do fast alter table? Fast what? Alter table, like, how do you do that? Oh, it just alters metadata. It doesn't, it doesn't update it. That's it. If you, if you add it, alter table add column means that you're simply creating metadata to store a new column, but you will still have the existing data. It doesn't have that column, and when you read it, you get nulls back. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a notion of like schema versions in some way, right? Or? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. 
core versions, you need to evolve your schema in a way that, um, that doesn't break existing stuff. So meaning in, in Parquet also when you use protobufs, write protobufs there's a certain way you do schema evolution in protobufs. Meaning you will never rename, reuse a field tag because that would totally break everything. And you, will, you shouldn't remove fields, you should simply only deprecate them. And if you add new ones, you add them at the end uh, with the new tag. Right? And if you do that, then you're fine. You can always read your old data. And all of the new stuff needs to be optional. Right? So that's basically what it is. Yes? Um, when you say you never do color instead of deprecating, what yeah. does that mean? What? Oh, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you have a column of data, and uh, not deleting it means you, you keep the old data around. And you simply deprecate it. Like sometimes applications, let's say you, you change application semantics, you want to encode something, some information in a different way. You will create a new column, but you don't have it populated yet. So if you want your applications to continue working, you basically now need to transfer the data from the old columns into the new columns. So every time you do that, uh, every large database application, you can never simply stop the world and then reload all your data and then change your application and start again, right? It always has to be kind of a piecemeal operation and you're doing piecemeal schema evolution and you're doing piecemeal data transformation, if that makes sense. Yep. But do you always uh, do the transformation when you have like a, an event for query, query uh, or do you do it uh, once you access it, you up update it to the new or newest schema? Um, the new schema is populated outside of analytic queries. So you need, you need to figure out, if you have SLAs, you cannot do heavy lifting and data transformations as part of your analytic queries. And sometimes you see data that needs to be transformed and sometimes you don't. That would be total, um, complete, uh, completely non-deterministic behavior, basically. Right? You, you would never be able to stay within your service level agreements, meaning right, for this web app, Every query needs to come back within 1.5 seconds or something, right? This is, this is typically what corporate environments have. If you have a, let's say you have a web app, um, you have a, a screen on your application and the screen needs, needs to run 30 queries in order to populate all of the UI um, components, right? Each of these queries needs to come back within a certain period of time. Otherwise, you are missing your SLAs. So. Um, a few words on physical schema design. Um, this is very important for analytic applications because it is important for performance. Physical schema design means that outside of just the logical schema, you now also decide how you physically partition your data over the uh, cluster. So um, typical things are time series. You find time series everywhere. When you talk about data warehouse environments, most fact tables are really time series, right? Data is collected chronologically. You know, you might have click logs, you might have impression logs. Um, here we're going to go through an example of uh, collecting machine metrics, right? For every host, you collect a, uh, a number of metrics every second or something like this. So these are all time series. And um, what you want to be able to do is uh, use time series, use your physical schema design mechanisms, which are partitioning, in order to support your application uh, characteristics, meaning make it so that you can do fast lookups or fast aggregate queries, and then also make it so you can use effective um, compression algorithms and stuff like that. So here's an example of a time series that is both hash partitioned and range partitioned. So here the y-axis is the range partitioning on the timestamps themselves, and the x-axis is another hash partitioning on another field. Let's say it's on the metric itself. Um, why do you not just want to? Uh, why do you not just want to range partition your time series data? Because in time series data, you typically append at the end, right? You, you generate new data all the time. The new data is for now. And if now falls in exactly one partition, you have a non-scalable system because that partition would have to take the entire update stream, insert stream, right? So that wouldn't be a good idea. So this is why in this case, you can also hash partition in addition to the time range partitioning. So in this particular example, you have 12 partitions. And each time range is serviced by three hash partitions, meaning your insert stream goes into these three partitions. So here's an example 
of, uh, of the inserts going to three partitions. Here's an example of uh, you basically querying on one of the um, non-time fields and which matches to exactly one of the hash partitions. So again, you're getting a reduction of the total scan volume you need for that analytic query. So now talking about Impala and Kudu combined, and I, I mentioned before that there are some operational differences of um, the database functionality offered through the Hadoop environment. And let's take a quick look at what a monolithic RDBMS looks like. On the left-hand side, you typically have, often in a single process, but sometimes not, multiple components that are layered. So you have the query execution component, which takes a select statement and turns that into a sequence of, uh, of a, it uh, turns it into a plan, which itself is a sequence of execution operators, scan, join, aggregate, which are then handed off to the execution environment, which then executes these operators um, as a sequence of base table accesses. So base tables are now exposed through a record interface. So you can um, do lookups into base tables and you can do range scans in base tables. This record layer in turn uh, implements this record abstraction on top of the storage layer, which gives you uh, blocks and byte sequences, basically. Alongside all of that, you have a catalog that records both logical metadata, you know, the tables, the columns, column types, as well as the physical metadata, the location, the, you know, the extents of the tables, which are then used by the storage API in order to facilitate the scans. You have that same functionality in the Hadoop environment, but now it is broken up into components. So Impala is a query engine, meaning it takes SQL and it runs, it basically executes these query operators, um, but it utilizes the underlying storage managers to supply, to supply the record layer um, functionality. So Kudu is a storage manager which with a record layer API. Parquet and HDFS together give you basically um, storage management plus a record level API, which is Parquet, right? Parquet has a record abstraction internally. You also have the Hive Meta Store that functions as the um, global metadata repository and the HDFS name node, uh, which in the HDFS case records physical metadata. There are advantages to, a, to such a decoupled architecture. One is that in this architecture, I, you only, I'm only showing Impala here, but you can also run um, against the same data that is resident in Kudu and uh, HDFS. You can run MapReduce jobs, you can run Spark jobs, you can run Hive jobs. So typically, people use multiple processing frameworks to access the data that is sitting in a Hadoop environment. Um, you can also, in this case, run a query that joins data from HDFS and Kudu in the same query. So these are both accessible at the same time. Um, this also means that because the SQL capability is separated out from storage management, et cetera, that if you introduce a new storage manager like we did with Kudu, you very quickly get uh, SQL capabilities in this environment. So here I'm going to run through uh, an example of, the met of a metrics table, a time series table, to illustrate how the um, physical schema design and the performance features of Kudu are exposed through SQL. So here's a, uh, the metrics table that we saw before, which you are creating. Every table in Kudu has a primary key, and um, you can then decide how you want to partition the data on that, uh, based on these primary keys. So in this case, we are doing hash partitioning into three buckets on the metric column of the primary key. And then we're also doing range partitioning on the timestamp column itself, which is the, what we, the example we had before. Um, now when you're running a select statement, Impala run, will then utilize the predicates that are present in the query to first of all do partition pruning, meaning it will um, figure out, given the predicates, which actual partitions, which tablets in Kudu need to be accessed. Um, you can see this on the right-hand side. The right-hand side is basically a printout of a query plan, and you can see that out of a total of uh, a number of partitions, we, you are, we are only accessing, based on the metric here, which maps to exactly one hash partition, we are only accessing three of the, um, 
uh, three of the tablets. Um, Impala will then also push down predicates that Kudu can evaluate directly. So this is the predicate on the timestamp and also the comparison on the metric column. Uh, things it cannot do, such as evaluating a like predicate, meaning regular expression matching, is then done directly in Impala. So it basically tries to offload whatever, whatever operations it can onto Kudu and then does the rest of the processing, such as the joining and aggregation, directly in Impala. Um, Impala and Kudu also share a common in memory representation, meaning that when we get the data back from Kudu, all we have to do is a bit of pointer transformation and we can then use the binary data directly, which is another performance advantage. Um, here's a single row insert, uh, not terribly exciting. The only uh, takeaway here is that basically this is then mapped directly onto a single Kudu API call, meaning you can write your uh, applications using SQL, using entirely using SQL, basically driving Kudu API as if you programmed against it directly. More interesting here, and a novelty for the Hadoop environment is an update statement. So previously, like I said, with HDFS, you are not able to update data in place. Um, with Kudu, that is possible. And uh, through Impala, you can then run update statements of arbitrary complexity, meaning you can do joins, etc. And they are basically transformed into a query plan that gathers the row IDs of the updated rows and gathers the update data itself. And then, um, executes the update, again, driving the Kudu API. Delete works in a similar manner. It's basically, you know, exactly like an update statement, except you're doing a delete at the end. And there is a question. So in these examples, you all have uh, size uh, metrics for all the tables. So do you maintain the statistic for the tables? Uh, Kudu does statistics maintenance. So for HDFS, we collect statistics outside of HDFS, but for Kudu, it uh, maintains its own statistics. So we get some, uh, you know, row counts and stuff like this through Kudu. What about like cardinalities, activities, and other you know, predicates? Like, like NDV? Um, not done in Kudu right now. And, uh, you know, we're thinking of ways of making that better. Yes? Yeah, in the uh, create statement for, for, this, for this example, you, you specify the, partition, the partitions you want it yourself. Uh, can it, can it automatically determine? It doesn't do that right now. So obviously for the hash partitioning, uh, you know, I have to declare the number of buckets. But uh, for range partitioning, it doesn't do, right here you're pre-partitioning it, um, which is actually good for bulk data loads. And, uh, but in the future, and it doesn't do re-partitioning right now, so it doesn't uh, automatically adjust the partition boundaries. But that's uh, a goal for the future, yes. Mm -hmm. If you don't do statistics in HDFS or other storage manager, how do you divide the cost using the cost model? In no, um, we, we create statistics, but we do that outside of HDFS, meaning um, you run a command that computes statistics, which we then store in the, in the Hive Metastore, and then use it at runtime to determine like cardinality estimation, try to figure out which you need to use for join order estimation or join order optimization, right? There's nothing, you can't do anything without selectivity estimates. So, yeah. But someone can be plopping down files in HDFS. That's right. And you don't know, and then like yes. you start scanning and like, oh, all of a sudden there's stuff there. Uh, yes, that's possible. Typically, I mean, we tell our customers to, you know, recompute stats when data has deviated by a certain fraction, right? You don't want to do that every time you drop new files in, it will, won't change the plans, right? But if you, if you let's say, load an additional 50% of data, then yes, it might. Let's leave that aside. Uh, how much time do we have, roughly? Yeah, 20 minutes or so. 20 minutes? Okay, all right, then I can talk also more about um, Kudu, pop out of that quickly and switch to this here. Talking more about tables and tablets in Kudu, um, I mentioned the partitioning. Um, with Kudu, Kudu does a consensus-based replication protocol, meaning in practice you would use three or five replicas and it uses Raft, not Paxos. Um, you have basically a table broken up into tablets. Tablets are usually on the order of, let's say, four gig, and those are then spread around across tablet servers. Um, the tablet servers then 
are, so for each tablet, this will then have three or five replicas. And the uh, replicas that it exists on basically form a replica group. And there's a leader and their followers. And the replication protocol will then determine what happens um, when you're doing an update, which needs to be done at a leader. You can do um, read-only transactions, which you can do against a follower. You can also have read-only replicas, uh, non-voting replicas, meaning you can scale up your number of replicas to a very large degree without impacting update performance. Right? When you're doing a consensus protocol, obviously um, the, uh, the update effort is proportional to the number of replicas that receive the updates. So in a practical system, you would have three or five replicas that participate in the updates, and you would have a much larger number. You could have a much larger number of read-only replicas, and you could use those to then satisfy your read traffic. Um, one goal here is also of this setup is that you run update workloads, meaning OLTP, quote unquote, and analytic workloads in the same system, right? And in any in most systems, you will always have many more reads, many more analytic queries and analytic workload um, as you will have updates. So being able to scale up your, uh, the number of read replicas is very important. Um, there is a, the system has a single master. This master is replicated. And uh, the master itself contains both the physical and the logical metadata. In particular, the physical metadata is the tablet directory. So if you want to look up row 15, whatever, row with key 15 in a particular table, you, um, your client will then talk to the, here in this example, talk to the master to figure out what tablet exactly that sits on. Right? The client also caches this metadata, so you won't have to do that over and over again for every single scan that you're running. Um, I mentioned Raft. Um, Raft obviously deals with um, failures. So here it basically regulates what you do when you have transient failures, what you have when you, uh, what you do when you have permanent failures, uh, leader re-election, etc. When you have transient failures, uh, followers can then basically drop off as long as you maintain a quorum. You're in good shape. When um, the a node recovers, it can then basically resume. It might, there might uh, need to be some data transfer. If the node drops off for too long, it basically f falls away. Um, the consensus protocol then figures out a new node that can, be, can, part, can become part of that replica set, and which is then repopulated with the data from the leader. Column storage, I don't need to tell, tell you about that. So switching back to this here. Um, going back, what now with this system, um, what can you actually do in terms of application architectures? So here, just to revisit, what does a typical um, analytic application look like in the Hadoop environment? Like you typically have something that generates, let's say, log data. Log data is generated in a row-oriented format, uh, which is then dumped into HDFS. Then you, because for performance reasons, you need to convert that into a columnar format. You typically do that through, let's say, you could use, um, you could use Impala or Hive or Spark. But the end result is that you then generate a bunch of Parquet files that you need to move to the directories that contain the table data. And only then will it become visible, right? This is when you want to add data. When you want to update data, you're kind of on your own. This is, it's very complicated. Uh, we have some customers that try to do very fine-grained partitioning and then when they have updates in a partition they drop the whole partition and then they reload the partition so it's very painful and it's usually a compromise between um, your update granularity and what you would like for reading right obviously update updates you want to do at a small granularity reading you want to do at a larger granularity so not really working terribly well with kudu in the picture the goal here is that you um, do direct updates against the system. You can either do streaming updates through something like Kafka, or you do data loading via SQL, either bulk load or streaming insertions. And then the data is present right away, and you can then query it, and you don't have to you know, go through different systems, and you don't have to worry about data freshness versus update performance. So here, just to summarize, what are you getting? Um, this is obviously targeted at a, an enterprise, you know, analytic data warehouse type um, audience. And those people are interested in basically 
getting SQL functionality, but also getting the ability to insert, update, and delete data. They need the connectivity, all that stuff. So this is something that you get from Impala and Kudu together. Um, you will be able to, because of the scalability of Kudu itself, you will be able to get very fast streaming inserts and general scalability, right? Scalability here by adding a new node. Again, I want to point out in traditional systems such as um, Parkcell or Redshift, uh, they often do things like physical hash partitioning. That means you, are, you decide the location of a piece of data based on the number of nodes that the data was created on. Uh, let's say you have an eight node system, which is actually not very atypical, uh, relatively small scale, and uh, all your data is physically, um, physically assigned to these nodes. If you want to add a node, you will have to reload your data because all of the physical addresses change, right? You hash partitioned it, that means all of the hash addresses change. This is very much a not flexible and not very scalable system because every time you increase something, you have to re reload your data. And that is not the case with Kudu, right? Kudu basically maintains a tablet directory. Kudu is able to, re, um, uh, to relocate tablets based on load patterns in the system. And so this is basically what you need in order to have a, a scalable system that allows you to scale up total node count during runtime. Right, things that Kudu doesn't do today are um, multi-row transactions. This is an important piece of functionality for traditional um, RDBMS applications and it's something we want to add in the future as well. And right now, batched inserts are, can be a little slower than you might be used to from your traditional enterprise data warehouse. Why? Uh, it's just you know, internal optimizations. No particular reasons. No architectural reasons. Um, so this basically concludes the talk. Again, just, uh, just to summarize here, you have a decoupled architecture in the Hadoop environment where the um, individual pieces of functionality are broken out into separate components. You can compose those components, um, but the components in essence work together to preserve the scalability and flexibility that Hadoop was basically designed for. And that's it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Marcel? Yes. And he just wrote, just, just told me yesterday, he's done the safe and needs some surgery. And asked me for help. He's what, sorry? My dog said needs surgery. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And You're going to do the surgery. I know that Calera just got IPO that last week, right? What? You just left him some money. So that he My dog needs $5,000 for surgery. No, okay. I, I, I know you're good for it. Hey, absolutely. Yeah, you <laughs> should just, you know, <laughs> hand a tin can around. Yes. Um, any, any non-fake questions? <laughs> <laughs> I put them up to that, sorry. <laughs> and what does that affect Impala, the IPO stuff? I mean, it doesn't affect Impala technically. Uh, Impala is, so in the you know, product portfolio of Cloudera, the analytic uh, data uh, warehousing workloads are very important, and Impala is a central component of that, right? So. Um, and obviously our investment in Kudu, Kudu has been going on for quite a while. It is, it is quite an investment, right? Creating a new storage manager is very expensive. And um, again, we see the added capabilities of uh, insert, update, delete, of the, the consistency semantics that you get from Kudu that is uh, beyond you know, things like eventual consistency that you get in traditional key value stores. We see that as very important and uh, critical to the success and you know, I would say broader appeal of data management solutions in the Hadoop environment. But if the client has like, uh, you want to geographicate his data, then doing strong consistent I personally, I disagree. I think it is. Um, this is what F1 and Spanner did. They do geo replication. They do five way replication across um, actually multiple data centers. And the reason here being you want geo replication for you know, business critical operations. 
but you also want consistency because without consistency, you can't really write applications, right? I mean, it's the, the degree of complexity that are inherent in typical applications is extremely high. And to try to do that while anticipating, you know, eventual consistency weirdness is simply too much for application developers, right? They are, they are experts in their domain. They are not distributed systems experts. So that's why you need to, you need a separation of, uh, of these things and basically present a simple interface. Like I said, in my mind, the single node RDBMS is sort of the, the gold standard in terms of comprehensibility and uh, functionality. Yeah, I mean, do, do you foresee maybe possibly the end of like, I mean, like, there's always me like a single node system for like, you know, people with WordPress website, right? things that can run on, on one machine. But for like, do you see the end of like, these monolithic sort of parallel data warehouses, like verticas and systems like the world? I mean, I don't see the end of anything. You're typically, that's, that's what uh, working in an industry has told me or taught me that um, existing systems never go away, right? They're simply augmented. But, and I don't foresee, you know, the oracles of this world to go away, but you will certainly see new applications and uh, new applications being done in these different systems that are not monolithic necessarily, also because of um, scalability concerns slash capabilities, which is very important. But also if you do a greenfield application, you know, you can, it's easier to retarget it against a new system. But um, yeah, and then also these new systems will handle a much larger amounts of data. And you see that even today, users like eBay's, which have been traditional Teradata, heavy Teradata users, they have 10 times as much data sitting in Hadoop. Um, and uh, you know, obviously their quote unquote high value data sits in Teradata, but this is sort of the pattern that you see that new applications in particular with larger data requirements are done in you know, systems like Hadoop. Yep. So when you were talking about eventual consistency not really working out, you said Google actually used Spanner, but then they used real-time talks and they had to synchronize them, which actually cost them a lot of money and they could afford it because they're Google. But like all your other customers, can they really afford this? They, they can't really manage to get data centers with synchron real-time synchronization of talks, right? Um, so the or something a uh, no, it uses a software protocol that, I forgot the name of it. There was some paper that basically did uh, two time uh, in software. So the hybrid clocks, the physiological clocks? Yeah, something like that, I forgot the name. Yeah. From Cambridge, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and uh, I feel like there was always too much of a focus on the, you know, the atomic clocks and spanner. Uh, in practice, they're actually not that, in, uh, that expensive, as far as I know. And um, it's just one aspect of the system, right? But it's the same techniques. You basically can implement them in, in software, and it is, it is usable. Yep. Um, do, you rec do you also replicate um, metadata? Oh, yeah, like typical and logical metadata, like the other data. In uh, you you know, okay, you should repeat the question because it won't show up on, on the video. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the question is, does Kudu, does Kudu replicate uh, physical and logical metadata? And the answer is uh, yes, to some extent. Kudu caches in the client. So physical metadata is basically the tablet directory that tells it where to find a tablet for a particular key. And that is cached in the client. But what if the primary storage is broken, uh, like the machine is not? The primary storage being broken. Which primary storage? What do you mean? The, you mean the leader or? The leader. Then there's a leader election process, and you figure out a new leader. And then. So you always guarantee that it's cached in at least n other uh, The caching is irrelevant, I think, um, and I'm not that familiar with Kudu because I don't work in it, but it might actually um, uh, probably doesn't. But so the tablet servers are involved in the leader election, and they can always refetch the metadata from the master. There's a master that has basically you know, the authoritative copy of all of the metadata. So the cache of the metadata is eventually consistent or the master always be consistent? Um, I don't want to talk too much about Kudu uh, of aspects. I don't, <coughs> I don't really understand, so I can't really answer that. 
Yes. So, like, we talked about non follow memory uh, the other day. So, I wonder if you, like, Carl can adapt to that if it comes out like this. Like, <laughs> right. Um, question was about non-volatile memory and what we would do in order to uh, adapt to systems that have lots of uh, NVRAM. And the answer is you would certainly need to evolve a storage manager like Kudu, right? You can all of a sudden, um, you know, different access structures become much, much more palatable, feasible. Uh, you would probably also, you would also need to evolve Impala. So for instance, with NVRAM, if you have data access, that is behaves much like memory, you can all of a sudden do join algorithms such as index nested loop join uh, much more broadly than you would do that today, right? So certainly cost models will change and uh, with that you might even want to implement new uh, query operators. Right, so the last question I'll, ha I'll ask is if you had a magic wand, you could fix one thing uh, sort of in, in a one-year span and a five-year span, like what, what would that be? Like what's something you want to fix right away? And what's something more long-term you wish you could fix? You mean fix as in, as in semantics or? Yeah, from, from a software engineering standpoint, from adding a feature, fixing a bug, like what's something you want to, you want to take care of in the next year? I see. And what's something you want to take care of in a five-year goal? Okay, sure. Um, I think the five-year goal is the, um, that's on the Kudu side, the multi-row transactions, and I'm not sure it takes five years, but it'll take some time, right? It's not easy. You need to um, layer a, basically distribute the transactions on top of the consensus protocol, which is what Spanner does, for instance. Um, greatly beneficial, but also somewhat complicated. The immediate thing that I'm actually working on is uh, Impala right now uses a, what I would call, non-deterministic multi-threaded execution model. And we want to transition that to a deterministic multi-threaded execution model along with um, reservations for memory and CPU. So, okay, so what does that mean, non-deterministic threading model? Uh, it basically means that when you have a query plan, there are certain operators themselves that are multi-threaded. So for instance, we're doing the build side of a join asynchronously. So you can have multiple builds, builds running at the same time. Um, that is non-deterministic in the sense that the degree of parallelism depends on the query shape. Um, you have scans themselves, we have multiple scanner threads that run in parallel and it's also non-deterministic because the, uh, the number of scanner threads depends on the total availability of threads in the system which depends on other queries that you're running. So this is, uh, this is where non-determinism comes into play. What you would really want for uh, resource management and for deterministic workload management is to have knobs like to specify exactly how much memory a query can use or how many active cores a query can use and then be able to execute exactly within that environment, within those constraints. That makes it possible to do effective workload management. That means you can have SLAs with tight bounds which uh, users like because that is predictability. So that's something that I'm actually actively working on. All right, let's thank mm -hmm. Marcel for coming. <laughs>